Hi, my name is Karsten Wolf, and I'm an assistant professor at the Norwegian U University of Science and Technology, where I teach a course called Advanced Integrated Circuits. Today is a lecture on, actually an introduction to the lecture on analog front ends and filters. So let's get started. So when it comes to the lectures, I, I'd like to explain a bit why I think the topic is important. And today it's a bit longer introduction because it's about the interaction with the real world. Now the real world is analog and how waves behave and how electronics work at a large scale is defined by the Maxwell equations, which you see here on the screen. Now these tell us how electric fields work, how magnetic fields work, and how they evolve over time. In addition to that, when it comes to electronics and solid state electronics, the behavior of the world, or the analog world, is described in quantum mechanics. And when if you study that, you'll know that there's something that we call the uh, probability amplitude of a particle, of an electron, for example, which says something about... Well, if you take the probability amplitude and you square it, or the norm squared, then you get the probability of finding an electron at that point. And those equations have sort of a position in space and a function of time. Now, if, when we look at the really small scale, how to figure out, for example, the time evolution of the energy is given by the uh, Schrodinger equation, which has uh, a voltage inside and uh, lots of different things. Uh, and also, when we look at sort of the, um, the density of charges in a semiconductor, so for example, how many electrons are there in a p-dope silicon and how many electrons is there any n-doped silicon? And we look at a relation for, of that in a p-n diode. It sort of goes back to quantum mechanics. So at sort of the fundamental level, the world itself and how everything behaves in the real world is analog. It's a function of time. And I do believe that time's not quantized. If if it if it, if somebody means it is, well, let me know in the comment section. For until all intents and purposes, everything we make on a chip has to interact with the real world somehow. But today, it turns out that most of the processing we do is in the digital domain. So something fantastic happened, well, I guess, back in the 70s, and even before that, uh, when it comes to Boolean al algebra. It turns out that you can create very simple rules for how to process or to calculate things. It's actually enough if you have a state that is true and a state that is false, and you create this uh, gate or this function that we call not A and B, which you see the truth table before you hear, it is actually possible to prove that any digital function or any di any processing that you can do inside a computer can be done with that simple function. Now that means that in the digital world, so where we do the mathematics and processing and compute and all that stuff, it turns out that you can actually abstract the real world away because all you need is something that give you give you a true state and a false state, which could be an inverter, for example. Now, that has created an interesting opportunity. Since we now describe the digital functions in a hardware description language like Verilog, it is actually possible for people that make digital circuits to write their system Verilog and then relatively easily somebody else can use that and know that it will work 
So I, I liken this to it's possible to actually stand on the shoulder of giants in the digital world. If somebody makes an IP and it has a self-contained controlled interface, it is easy to reuse. However, for analog, it's different. <laughs> analog designers, well, we teach you stuff, right? But in the end, we can't really give you an IP and say, this is the op amp that you're going to use for the rest of li your life, and you not won't need to change it. We can teach you how to make an op amp. But actually dealing with the real world when you make circuits, that you have to do on your own. It's extremely hard to reuse analog IP because the interfaces, the impedances uh, on both inputs and outputs, and also Maxwell's equations and how the currents in the circuit affect the currents at the, uh, for example, currents in a DC DC converter on a radio chip, how the high frequency content of that DC DC can actually affect the radio circuits on that same chip. So that means that we teach you strategies for how to deal with the real world, but in the end, you actually have to do the work. So I give you a postulate. Maybe we should actually do as much as possible in this abstract digital world where we can reuse things. Maybe we should do most of our processing there. But in order to do that, we have to have something that can, conv can converge from the real world and the equations there to a digital representation of ones and zeros. So let's imagine that we start with some sort of sensor. This could be a current or it can be a voltage, it could be a charge, it can be any quantity that you want to measure in the real world. Now, quite often, in order to convert that into digital, well, we could take the analog to digital converter and stick it right at the uh, sensor. But usually, these type of sensors are maybe very weak signals, or they were only interested in a certain frequency behavior of the sensor and not the hum from uh, the electric grid, for example. So quite often we need some sort of amplification and frequency selectivity and even domain transfer. And what I mean by domain transfer here is, for example, if the sensor outputs a very weak current and we want to drive the ADC and the ADC requires a low source impedance, then we need to drive it with something that looks like a voltage source. So then we need to convert from a current into a voltage. So kind of like a domain transfer. And it could be something else also. Maybe it's from temperature or whatever. We have to sort of convert it into something that is easy to feed into an ADC. One example of a system like this is a radio receive chain. So there we have the antenna as a sensor which receives a certain signal power. Now, usually the signal power at sort of a Bluetooth type of chip or the antenna that is used on a Bluetooth type of chip, the received signal there is very weak. It can go down to what we call minus 90 dBm, which is, let's see, minus 90, 10 to the power of minus 90 divided by 10 is 10 to the 9, so that's 1 giga, uh, and it's 1 milliwatt, so that's 1 picowatt. So it's 1 picowatt that actually comes into the antenna, which I believe in 50 ohm is, it should be, order, it should be on the order of 50 uh, microvolts. It's a very, very weak signal. Now, <laughs> you could say that we want to convert that to digital, but that's really small. So we want to amplify it first. So usually there is a low noise amplifier. And then quite often there's a set of complex mixers because we do the single processing in the complex domain. So here we have 
the local oscillator, for example, operating at 2.4 gigahertz, where we have phase shifted one of them by 90 degrees. So we sort of get a complex value out here. The reason for that is that when you shift in the frequency domain from 2.4 gigahertz down to zero, uh, down to something low, it makes sense to actually be able to do that without creating what should we call it? A kind of a folding. So, for example, if we wanted to shift down 2.4 10 megahertz down to 10 megahertz, we'd multiply with 2.4 gigahertz in these mixers. And that shifts the, the interesting signal, the <laughs> signal, the wanted signal, down to 10 megahertz. However, but it will also shift what we call the image on the other side. We'll get to a complex signal processing later. But then maybe we're not interested in everything. There might be there might be other um, sources of radio signals quite close. Maybe it's your PC or you have your TV advertising or actually asking for somebody to connect. You might have your phone. And you want to be able to do all this at the same time. So quite often we sort of select a certain part of the spectrum that we say this is the channel or the frequency we want to communicate on, but we don't want to listen to everything else. So that means we have to filter, we have to remove some of the others, we call them blockers. Now the difference in these the, the signal strength difference in, in these difference of wanton signal versus a blocker signal can be very large. can be, well, 50 dB or something. So that means we have to make a filter. And, and after that, we can put in an analog to digital converter to convert the parts of the frequency spectrum that we're interested in into digital. Now, both of these can be made what we call polyphase or complex. So you can actually use complex signal processing in the filters and in the ADC if you want to. But the topic for today is really to dive a bit deeper into parts of this analog front end. I want to stress a really important point. Before you start to design any analog front end, you actually need to know the application. So you can't really make a general purpose filter and then use it everywhere. It's a good example of a type of IP where you actually must know exactly the application before you try and design it. You have to know, if I go back a bit, you have to know the impedance of the mixers and how the signal coming out of that looks, and you have to know the impedance of the ADC and how much load it has, for example, before you can actually design this thing in the middle. And <laughs> not, of course, let's not forget, you need to know how much gain you should have in the filter or what sort of bandwidth you should have. So what we're going to look, to look at today is a couple of methodologies to synthesize filters. Now, quite often when we look at filter synthesis and those type of topics, it turns out that if you had a first order filter and you have a second order filter, sort of general purpose, then you can synthesize any order filter because you can break down the higher order poly polynomials into first and second order stages. Now they might have complex, uh, the polynomials might have uh, real roots or complex roots, but both of those are possible to implement in an integrated circuit Although, if you are using complex numbers, then you actually have to implement two real paths. So, for first order filters, it's quite often described like this. So, we have an input signal and we have an output signal. And if we have a configuration where we have an integrator, so 1 over s, and some feedback, and uh, something that we multiply with an s, you can actually work out that the transfer function of this thing is here, sort of a general purpose first order filter. Now, <coughs> you can try and calculate. I'd like you to try and calculate to make sure that I've done this correctly. The From this uh, signal flow graph to the transfer function. Now, the reason we sometimes use the signal flow graphs is that 
it's possible to simplify larger systems sometimes based on the signal flow graph. So for example, if I first had a K01 and another K1, then it's easy to combine them. I know that there's a single signal, <laughs> single signal going in this direction. You can do the same for second order filters. And quite often they talk about biquads or biquadratic, which is simply another name for you have a transfer function that has two quadratic polynomials. Now, I also like to like you to try go from the signal flow graph and transfer that into or actually calculate the transfer function, so the output voltage divided by the input voltage. But <coughs> that this is just a pretty picture, right? So how do we go from this to actually a circuit? So there's two strategies that are most commonly used. The first one is something called GMC or transconductance C. The principle of those is that you have an input voltage. So here we assume that the input signal is in the voltage domain and we have a transconductor. So a transconductor will turn a voltage into a current. We feed that current into a capacitor and then we can work out that the transfer function of this is this uh, omega ti divided by s, where the omega ti is gm divided by c, which is where the gm divided by c comes from. Now, we have previously talked about the transconductance of transistors, for example, the gm of that. And quite often when we talk about transconductance of transistors, we talk about small signal and sort of the, uh, the small signal domain. But I want you to think about, in this case, if the input signal here is actually quite large, several hundred millivolts, is then the transconductance, so inside here there's some transistors, right? Possibly. <laughs> is then the transconductance, the small signal transconductance equal to the large signal transconductance? How does that work? So at this point in the video, I discovered I'd made a pretty horrendous mistake. And that's something that happens quite often to me. My brain just, well, it's a brain fart. It, it does something really stupid and I get very simple things wrong. And that, that's good to know. That will happen with me. That's just how my brain works, which is why we'll have this discontinuity in the video. Anyway, I usually, well, I usually find them myself after a while, uh, but if I if I haven't gotten there yet, and you see something that you really feel is wrong, then let me know. I'll be happy to fix it. Anyway, when we look at the GMC, so uh, in the video I just talked about uh, this slide, and I was going to talk about differential circuits. Now I had done the equations wrong. But now it should be correct. So quite often when we integrate on integrated circuits, we use differential circuits. And the reason for that is it improves, for example, noise immunity. So if the power supply jumps up and down and that couples to our nodes inside the circuit, then if we have a differential system and both of the inputs jump up and down equivalently, then in the differential circuit, we don't really see that, so we have some noise immunity. And also for GMC, it's possible to do differential circuits. So in this case, we can see that the current coming out of the positive side of the transconductor is GM times VI, and on the negative side, we have a current going into the transconductor of GM times VI, which means that the current in the capacitor here is GM times VI. And that gives us the same equation as for the previous page. There's another really useful feature of differential circuits. And that's actually something I want you to try and think out on your own. So what happens if I flip the plus and minus sign on the output here? What happens to the transfer function? And this is something that is really easy to do.
an integrated circuits because you're just flipping two wires. Okay, now back to the original video. In the book, you can see the general purpose sort of first order filters. This is one for GMC, and they have worked out that this is the equation that you get, and you can e then easily see that K1, for example, here is Cx divided by Ca plus Cx. So that means if you have your transfer function, now where do you get that? Well, you have used MATLAB or something to, s to synthesize or, or give you the H of S, the filter, uh, the transfer function or the filter that you want. And it might be Butterworth, it might be Chebyshev, it might be all those different type of filters. That's not in this course. That should have been in previous courses. If it hasn't, then go into MATLAB and learn the different filters. Maybe wait until you actually need it. Then just know that when you need a filter, you need to decide on what type of filter. And the type of filter will depend on what the application is. Do you need to have low ripple in the passband, for example? Is, is it important with the group delay variation over frequency? Right, but I want you to try and work out. So go from the picture here into the transfer function. That's a good exercise and try to do that before lecture. So, in the book they also have the picture of a general purpose biquad GMC filter, which we see here in the figure. And for this, well, let's just trust them and s see that, okay, this is the general purpose. And you can, if you have your transfer function and you have the values for the, the different um, Ks and omegas and Qs, you can pretty much work out which combination of Cs and GMs gives you that transfer function. And we're not gonna do that. I'm not gonna ask you to actually calculate it also. This is actually a good example or, or where we don't have to do something ourselves. So if you need it, you can use some other's work at this point. Because here, you can just plug in the equations and you get something out and it, it, it gives you a starting point. Now actually implementing the circuit, designing the transconductor and figuring out what capacitors you, you want to have and what problems you're gonna face, that's the real world challenge. So in this bipod, you can also see the um, DC gain. So if we insert for J omega for the S's and set the omega to zero, these factors drop away. And we can see that the gain of this filter is actually, can be, or is equal to GM4 divided by GM1, because this factor drops away, the GM2 drops away, and this factor drops away. Now we can always set the GM1 to zero, which gives us then, then an infinite gain at zero frequency. That's just dropping the GM, removing it, not having it there. So you can play with these transfer functions and get the, the filter, uh, filter performance or filter transfer function you want, or the filter that you want, I should say. Okay, there's another type of filter. Oh, yes, before we go there, this is GMs. I'd like you to try and figure out how could we make that and, and look at the differential ones because that's the ones that we're gonna use or that's the ones that you should use. How could we implement a transconductor? And start simple, don't go crazy. It's always good when you design something like a circuit like this, you start with the simplest possible implementation of a transconductor. And you see if the performance of that, the output impedance, the linearity of the transconductance is good enough for your application. If it's not, then you have to find something more advanced, more advanced circuit. So try and figure out how we can make that, and we go into that in the lecture.
Another class of filters is, of course, Active RC. I hope, I sincerely hope you've had that in previous courses, but as a refresher, you can make a general purpose first order filter, like shown in the figure here. Now, almost always in books and things like that, we show it as a single ended thing. So here we have the positive input connected to ground. That's pretty hard to do in an integrated circuit unless you have a negative supply. So quite often we make these differential. Now you can work out that the transfer function of this thing uh, is as given here. And we can notice something, and that is that if we do the DC gain again, we can see that, uh, let's, hold, let's set the S's to zero, and then we can see we get, let's see, it's G1 divided by G2 is then the DC gain. Now I've written G here, and not so the conductance, not the resistance. It just makes it easier to work out the equations. But the conductance is equal to one of the resistance. So here also you can make a first order filter. And I'd like you to try and work out the transfer function. You should have done that a few years ago, but please do it again. For the biquad or the biquadratic, you can do the same thing and you can work out that a filter that looks something like this, where you have conductances and uh, capacitors and two op amps, then you can get a general equation and depending on the filter you want, you can again figure out how big the resistor should be and capacitors and so on. Now one thing that is important is that this op amp, so for for GMC type of filters, it is making the transconductor that is hard, making that linear enough. For Octave RC, it is making the op amp good enough. But what do we mean by good enough? So if you work out what actually happens when this op amp has a finite gain given by, so this is the open loop gain of A0, and a unity gain frequency of omega ta, you can work out that this is the actual transfer function. And I want you to try and maybe plot this in Python or something, and try and figure out in what region would this circuit actually look like the integrator we expect it to be. So we can see here, uh, had we made this into an integrator, well, ideal op amp, then the current going into the, the virtual ground node would also go out through the capacitor, which would integrate the current. So the current, the conductance, or the current would be given by VI divided, uh, well, VI, um, divided by the resistance or times the conductance and for the capacitor, well, it will be an integrator. We're feeding a constant current into a capacitor. Okay, that's the introduction for today. I'll see you in the lecture. No, sorry. One more thing, I forgot about this. Ah. Okay, this is just a peek into a paper that actually uses these active RC filters. And it's not only differential, it is also complex. So it's using two signal paths, here and here. And you can also see there are these cross couplings between the signal paths for, um, yeah. And the cool thing about complex filters is it actually allows you to do something fun in the frequency domain. And if you're not used to complex filters, then this x-axis might look strange because we have a frequency from 0 to 170 and 0 to minus 170. And you can think a bit about what that means. But you can actually create asymmetric filters. And this is actually what we call a continuous time signal delta modulator. So it's converting from an analog sig signal into, let's see where the outputs are, probably here and here, a digital value. 
and it does something cool which is it converts and filters at the same time and what we see in uh, black here is actually what we call the noise transfer function so the noise of this analog to digital converter is lower but only for a selected bandwidth and that's also where our signal transfer function is one we'll get into sigma delta modulators a bit later but this is sort of an application where you can see a typical rc filter and a complex one with cross-coupling then we're done thanks